I thought I'll come in from the other side tonight uh, because it's a very beautiful evening out there. Uh, it's a better serata. I need light. Um, I see that many of you survived last week. 44 people survived. 43 from the class, and one was a guest uh, uh, who is not a student, so I don't know. I have a certificate. If any, it has a Greek last name, so if anybody knows who he was, uh, please. Yeah, and, um, um, it wasn't bad night. Those who were here, you know very well. That, um, uh, the first time I had this human con condition screened, in 81. Many of you were not born yet. And uh, I had it scheduled early in the semester. It was perhaps end of February or beginning of March. It was winter time. And I was living in Germantown. So when the film was finished, it was dark, snowing. And I was going home. And my car broke down just after Tivoli. So I pulled it, pushed it to the side, and uh, what do I do now? It's like four, five in the morning, no traffic. So I started to walk. It was snowing. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is true. Uh, farther down, a dog started attacking me. So, <laughs> so I went, I got a stick, and a couple of cars passed by, and I tried to hail, but oh, nobody would stop at that time of night, of course. So I walked. It took me a good hour or two hours to walk back, and it started getting lighter, and it was still snowing. And I was thinking, I'm living the film all over again. I said, oh, Michika, Michita, Mich I'm coming home, I'm coming home. <laughs> and and uh, it was the extension of the, of the film that, uh, it left a very, very deep impression on me, even today. <laughs> and uh, it was snowing very hard. And, um, and uh, I was thinking, will I make it or not? I made it. And um, that reminds me uh, that start thinking about the finals. Please. The sooner you do it, the better you will feel. And you'll make me feel very good. I don't want to have anyone leaving college without submitting anything of great interest to me. I, what the heck is that? Or, or oh, never mind. I see somebody here that <laughs> doesn't doesn't look human. <laughs> uh, all right. So last time, <laughs> last week was the end of World War II. And um, then we had 50s and 60s in this country. And we had um, what we known as the beat generation came into being. Originally, the beat generation were poets and writers. Uh, painters came in much later. I think the filmmakers came in immediately after the poets. Musicians are uh, all we had, I think, John Cage and Lucia Dulokashevsky. There was not much happening in music during the beat, beginning of the beat generation. Uh, during the beat, beginning of the beat generation, what we had was the family, what I would refer not the the way Republicans would talk about the family unit. The family was still intact. Children and parents w were together. And uh, the expression of uh, generation gap, that word, expression, did not exist yet. And that came in after the Beatles. Uh, when Elvis sang, and I don't think you heard because you are talking so loud in the beginning, that was Elvis. Are you lonesome tonight? 
anybody and everybody could sing along with Elvis. And when Frank Sinatra sang, everybody could sing along. And when the Beatles came, we could sing. There was no generation gap yet. Everybody could sing. But when you think back now, could anybody sing the songs of today? And that's where the problem started, that it became you and us, and us meaning younger generation, and you, the older generation, you don't understand us. That generation gap was really very commercially orchestrated, money-oriented event there. And right now, at Bard, we have about, what do you say, about 20 or 25 music groups, bands. Across the country, we must have 25,000 bands trying to be number one. All this money, 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 greedy, greedy, dog eat. This is what's happening right now. I come from a different culture, perhaps different times. I don't want to say generation. I don't know what generation is. I come from different times where to go and get fa rich fast, go after the money, was not in our blood. And dog eat dog, I don't understand even today because I'm a cat man, so uh, I don't eat dogs. Uh, that's why perhaps I'm poor. Um, every semester, for example, I'm getting about 50 students coming, applying to get into my script writing class. Most of them have heard or read the news that somebody received $5 million for a script. So now everybody wants to get those $5 million. So they come and say, please teach me how to write a script that I could get $5 million. It's like somebody going to a painting professor and asking, please teach me how to paint a great painting, or how to become a great dancer, or how to write a great book. It's all stupid. First, I'll go back to the script. I'll help somebody to write a script if they have something great to say. That's what makes it great. Nothing else makes a script great but what you are saying. Same thing in all other arts. And uh, I advise many of these people who want to be great and get those five million dollars, I tell them, go and buy a lottery ticket, you, you have a much better chance. I know it's not their fault. Because all this uh, money, money, madness, get rich, be famous, it's under your skin too, I know. When I was 50 years old, not long ago, I have a list here. I didn't own a house, which is most un-American, I understand. I didn't have a savings account. I didn't have owned stock, shares, portfolios, and name it zilch. I didn't even know what that is. I didn't have a life insurance. I still don't have a life insurance. I didn't own a car when I was 50 years old. I also I didn't know how to drive. And I didn't have health insurance, which I still don't have. When I grew up in my culture is that when you got sick, you died. <laughs> right. Now we have insurance against debt. I don't understand that. Don't we believe in debt anymore? What's happening? Insurance against debt? I think this insurance business takes joy out of living. You live, you get old, or get sick, and you die. I have no problem with that. 
Not at all. Um, today, I'm still living. I get a paycheck every two weeks. I'm still living from paycheck to paycheck. I can't save anything. Um, about two years ago, there was a professor at Bard, hired recently. By mistake, I received her paycheck and automatically opened because, uh, because they come in with these stamps, confidential. I didn't look. I, I knew it was a paycheck. Opened. I realized it's not my paycheck. And uh, what I did not realize was that at that time, I was at bar 25 years. She was four years. And her paycheck was $12,000 more than mine. She was minority, if that means anything. But a year later, she didn't get a tenure. She was kicked out. But that tells something about what's happening. I don't know. What's, what is the moral of that story? Uh, some of my graduates, film graduates, uh, from years back, had retired already to some fancy places. I'm still here doing cried sheets and uh, scratching. Uh, uh, we are reaching the end of the semester. I think we are getting a little bit giddy. And uh, a fling weekend is coming up. Uh, you know what that means. Uh, there will be a lot of drinking and um, fun time. But I can't let you go without telling you the story of Abby Hoffman. Anyone here who doesn't know who Abby Hoffman was or is, Abby Hoffman was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> yippie revolutionary. In 1968, he ran a pig for the president. He had a national campaign. Um, uh, the pig was on the posters, and uh, that the year was when Nixon was running for president also. So they were running a pig. And uh, those who know who Abby Hoffman was, I think it's very difficult to explain. Uh, who don't know who he was, it's almost impossible to explain. <clears throat> and um, in the 60s, myself and my brother Jonas, we made a film, Guns of the Trees, that uh, received prizes in Europe, but we had difficult time exhibiting in this country. And we received a letter from uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, from certain Abby Hoffman, inviting us to come and show our film to him. He was a theater manager of, in Worcester. So we arrived there, and um, we screened the movie. And um, he invites us for lunch. Before we go to his house, he was very, very proper. He had a tie. He, he was well-dressed, like a movie manager, uh, clean. So he said, you have to buy some food for lunch, because we don't have, don't have much in the house. So we go to a supermarket, and uh, I see that he's looking at prices. Uh-oh. I'm going to help him. So I didn't look at prices. I just grabbed caviar. And Pate and all these things, and I was, I was, I was, and I had a, this, I had a big coat. It was uh, October, November was late, and uh, I was getting fat in the supermarket. So we go home. I'm stuffed, and uh, I go in the kitchen. I unload on the kitchen table, and then his wife comes down from upstairs, and she, I walked out uh, in the living room, and I, I could hear her screaming at him. How can you do that? We can't afford all these people from New York to buy all this food. And he was so straight. He, he would not admit that these people from New York were stealing food from them. He was very, very proper. 
So I do take certain pride in corrupting Abby Hoffman. And he learned fast, <laughs> learned very fast. Uh, what I didn't know at that time that the film was screened, he hated, hated every moment of it <laughs> until the book came out. And there's a chapter here about it. Then I realized how much he hated the film. <laughs> the book's called <laughs> Steal This Book. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'm on. And over the years, um, uh, my Cinemagic class brought me quite a few of these books. I have a box of them, Steal This Book. They have been stealing and giving them to me. <laughs> I have a collection of them. <laughs> Uh, uh, all right, um, tonight uh, I'm not going to be talking much. Um, you'll be talking. Let's see what I can do for you. Before we go to the movies, um, uh, you'll see uh, four very short senior projects going back to different times. I'll speak very briefly, one sentence perhaps before each one. Uh, the first one is going to be, um, if we change the order, let's see if I have the right order. Uh, no, the, what? That will be the uh, on video on videotape, right? <laughs> we change the order. Yes, just the table away is going to be the first one, right? Uh, uh, the scriptwriter for this short uh, uh, was um, Meredith, Anne Meredith, who today is in Hollywood. She had about five or six of her scripts produced. And this is her first attempt at script writing. But before we see the movie, we have a special event here. We have two birthday kids tonight. Uh, and I have a present for each one. Uh, GJ, happy birthday. And Blanca. Lista, where are you? Come front. Where are you? Yeah. Happy birthday. 